And welcome once again. This is another episode in the series about finances in the show Leaders del Futuro. Previously, we have done one specifically on finances, the basics of banking. And we also have done another video on the process that you follow in order to purchase a vehicle. You're welcome to check that out on my YouTube channel, Leaders del Futuro. Today, I want to talk about investments, and I've been thinking about it for a while in regards to when is the right time to make this video. I did a couple of workshops with individuals uh, over Zoom, and uh, it seems like a lot of individuals get really confused about investments, and instead of doing multiple workshops, I thought I'd rather just do the video now, and then people can reach out if they have a specific questions. My name is Rafael Vasquez Guzman, and today again, we're gonna talk about investing in the stock market. We are, gonna, we are going to talk about retirement. We're gonna talk about a few other things. So how many of us have everything planned for retirement? Again, I always talk about the 10 year plan. And when I work with students, whether it is at high schools, community colleges, when I work with immigrant families and I ask them, you know, what is, your 10 year plan, they absolutely don't have one. So then we lower it and we say, what's your five year plan? And many individuals don't have a five year plan. If you're gonna be successful and you're gonna be able to retire in your forties, if needed in your fifties, depending how old you are when you're looking at uh, this information or getting this information, then again, you have to have a plan. And that is the issue, that many, if not most of us, live on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have been misguided to believe that tomorrow happens for sure, and something will work out, and somehow, whether we get ready for it or somebody comes and helps us at the last minute, we're going to be okay. Unfortunately, this type of mistake creates more problems than it solves because there are individuals that because they didn't have a plan later on, they get sick perhaps later on in their lives and they find out that the money that they had barely saved for retirement is not even enough to be able to last another five to 10 years when their life expectancy is 25 to 30 or 40 more years. So I'm spending a lot of time in this question because I am hoping that you will take the time and seriously think about this. Start working on the 10 year plan. And it's okay if maybe your parents are not ready or your children are not ready or your spouse is not ready, but when I talk with people, I also tell them, if you're gonna start dating, one of the first dates that you go on, you need to talk to that person and find out what is their retirement plan? What is their 10 year plan? And if that person doesn't have one and you have one, then you should really consider whether or not that person is gonna make you bankrupt later on. And if you're willing to give it a chance and try to educate that person and the benefits of planning and so on and so forth, and after a month, two or three, that person is not willing to change and is wasting money on shoes and this and that, then maybe it's not the right time to date that individual. The question when I ask also, how many of us plan to stay in this country the rest of our lives, comes from the point of view that a lot of people haven't even considered the possibility that you can retire in a country where the cost of living is less expensive. For example, thousands of individuals have gotten visas to be able to live in countries like Mexico, and if you're making about $2,000 a year from your retirement, then they allow you in some parts of Mexico to live there because the cost of living is much, much cheaper. 
and it doesn't have to be there. There are other countries where you could go and stay and live. Uh, Costa Rica is one of those countries as well. But again, look at the cost of living in other places in the world and see if your plan that you have, if you have one, is going to be able to help you make it work. It's important that you start thinking about it. And it's never too early to start thinking about that. If we are parents, have we set up a college savings plan for our children, such as a five to nine savings plan, where you put you know, several hundred dollars a year, and by the time those children turn 18, they'll have some money at least to be able to go to college, university, and not have to be worrying about loans. Maybe you have younger siblings and your parents haven't started this, start the conversation. It's called the 529 plan. Most of the states in the United States have a plan similar to this. In California, it is, you can get information directly from the state of California, just type 529 plan California, and something should come up that is going to get, get you the information you need. And it's basically all these people put their money together. It is invested. And as a result of that, you know, through compound interest, you can make more money. You can also get family members. I keep saying this in other, uh, you know, discussions. Instead of people bringing you a bunch of presents for birthdays of the kids or Christmas or other stuff like that, ask them to make little donations to that 529 plan. And what you're accomplishing two things by doing this. One, you're preparing your children or your siblings or, you know, some, a child either way to be able to pay for college without being worrying about loans. But two, sometimes that leads to a conversation. What is the five to nine plan? And why don't I have one for my child? And you can educate other individuals and they too can benefit from this. And that's the benefit of creating videos that if you find information useful, I want to make sure you understand you should feel comfortable with sharing the information with other individuals. And again, many individuals who are now in their 40s, in their 50s, and they now are starting to look at retirement, they notice that they will not have the money to be able to pay for their retirement. And as a result of that, they may feel that they're going to rely on their children. And in fact, especially in the Latinx immigrant community, there's always a joke that the children are their parents' retirement plan. But in reality, that creates a huge, huge level of stress for those children who have to take care of their own families most of the time. We shouldn't be a burden to our children in or all age. And I'm just not talking about finances. I'm talking about, again, who's going to change your diapers and should your children change your diapers? Yes, if you're looking at it from a philosophical point of view, perhaps that's the way to go. But when you look at it from a practical point of view and you need two and three diaper changes a day and your child who's now professional is working as a lawyer or is working as a doctor or is working as any other type of professional, do you want to take, you know, to have that responsibility where they have to take time of work several times a day to come and take care of you? Right? That's the mentality we have to think. And then the other one is how much will we need for retirement? And this one goes back to the first one because it has to do with what type of lifestyle you want to have and where do you want to retire. Do you plan to retire in Costa Rica or you plan to retire in Japan or you plan to retire somewhere in Europe is going to be a different expense than if you plan to retire in the United States. And again, the second question that goes with this is at what age do you want to retire? And the third one is what type of lifestyle do you want to have? 
Are you just gonna sit around and watch TV all day? Are you gonna be active? Do you wanna travel? All those factors will make a big difference in the amount of money that you're going to need for return. So how do we get started with this process? We must understand that retirement is where you're sitting on top of a three-legged stool, like a bar stool, and that may include social security income, a retirement plan, and I'll talk about the difference between a 401k and a Roth uh, 401 uh, in a minute. But again, you have to have multiple incomes. Now, before the 1980s, if you work for a large company, the company was responsible, legally responsible, for creating a retirement plan for you and investing in that plan. And that pension, as they used to call it, was the money that was coming in to help you retire. Social Security and that. But in the 1980s, right, it all fell apart and companies convinced Congress to change the rules. And as a result of that, the famous 401k became the new reality. That means that somebody is investing in the company to a certain amount and you're investing up to a certain amount. And if you start early, the hope is that the fees that the bank that is running the retirement plan are not too high and the processing fees when it's time to retire and this and that is not going to eat too much into your retirement plan. And out of 200,000, 300,000, you may actually end up with a little bit of money between social security, the retirement plan, and then the other piece being the independent investment between those three is how you should be able to have enough money to survive for the rest of your life. And again, I go back to this thing. What type of lifestyle do you want? How many years are you going to survive after retirement? And when do you plan to retire? That will determine how much money do you need to have in order to be able to afford this. Some individuals, they start getting Social Security. They're in really good health. They have a retirement plan that is coming in. Uh, they have some investments that we'll talk about. And then they still work a few hours. Or other individuals decide that they're going to retire at 50. Well, Social Security will not kick in for several years. And you're not going to be contributing to Social Security anymore. So people work maybe as photographers, maybe a few hours in an office just to have enough but they feel comfortable because they have these other investments that are making them money. And so it's important to ask as well, starting today, how many years do you have before retirement? You have to start planning. If you don't have enough money, then obviously you cannot retire, or you have to adjust the type of retirement that you want to have. Meaning again, maybe you're getting some money from your investments, but you're gonna have to work a little bit the rest of your life because you're not making enough money. And that brings us to the types of investments that there are. I wanna clarify that a vehicle, mistakenly, a lot of people think that if they buy a BMW, if they buy a Porsche, if they buy these other vehicles, that these are investments. What I have found is if you buy a BMW, brand new, let's say for $50,000, you sign the documentation and it's now your responsibility, the moment you drive out of that car lot or car dealership, that BMW has technically lost between three and 5% in value, which means if you try to sell it, you're not gonna get the same amount because it's now a used car. You still call it new, 
but to the rest of society is a used car. Therefore, a vehicle is not an investment. A vehicle is a drain on your resources. The only exception to this rule is if you have a classic vehicle, a classic car, like a car that everybody's interested in, and that the longer you have it and in good condition, it's going to increase in value. Other than that, a vehicle is definitely not an investment. A home, when you start buying that home, you see it as an investment, but in reality, it is taking a lot of money out of you in taxes, in interest, so on and so forth. A home technically doesn't become an investment until you have paid at least half of the money that you borrow on that investment, right? And here is where I stop for a second and remind you that when you are ready to buy a home for six months before you do that, you say, you know, I'm paying $1,500 on this apartment. I'm ready to buy a home. You go and you have a conversation with someone about how much is it going to cost. And in the future, I'll do another training specifically on the process of buying a home. But what is that equivalent of a rent in, is going to increase to what? 2,500, 2,400? And then you're going to pay taxes. Is that included? Well, then you have to get insurance on that home. Then you have to get earthquake insurance if you're in California. Flood insurance if you are maybe in other parts of the country. And as a result of that, again, it's a drain on your resources. It's not until you have paid off at least half of the value of the home that then it becomes an investment, especially if the prices of those homes have gone up. I'm creating this training on April uh, 10th of 2021. At this moment, if you have been purchasing a home for a while, the value of your home has gone up, especially in places like Northern California and other parts of this, the country. And as a result of that, this is a seller's market, which means a lot of people are desperate to buy a home because they see it as an investment that you can sell a home that is worth $450,000 right now for $550,000 and people will, uh, will pay for it. Therefore, your profit there, let's say you owe $150,000 and suddenly you sell it for $550,000, there is a profit. And then it is an investment. But if you sell it, Maybe you're selling it because your children are grown and you don't need a three-bedroom house. Maybe you need a one-bedroom condo. So you go and you buy the condo, you sell the house, you buy the condo, and you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars maybe set aside and invested in the stock market towards retirement. And I'll talk more about it. Again, it's important that we don't see a home as an investment because at first it's gonna take out a lot of your money. And of course, never get a home with a variable interest. The loan cannot, that cannot be the case because that's what happened in 2008 and so many people lost their home. But this today, April 10, 2021, this is not a buyer's market for homes. Wait a few months, maybe even until 2022, until people start, uh, you know, start losing their homes, and then it will be a buyer's market. Don't make a mistake right now. And again, when we talk about 401k, I'll talk here about 401k, and in a few minutes, I'll talk about the Roth 401k. Again, as a retirement plan, these companies have said, we will come match you up to, let's say, $2,000, $3,000 a year. So if you put $3,000, we'll put $3,000. And after that, if you want to put more money on that 401k, that's on you and good for you. But we, the company, are not going to put a lot of money. 
the issue with it is you have to investigate which company they have the plan with. Because some companies, when it's time to, you sign all the paperwork, it's done in five minutes, you don't know what you signed, you're excited with your new job, and that's all that matters to you. But before you sign it, you should ask for the documentation and then investigate what is the percentage that this company is going to take. Is it an actively managed investment or is it passively managed? Which means if it's actively managed, these people are going to charge this 401k account a pile of money to manage it. Even though most of these managers that are doing this don't do very well in the management. Passive investments, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, are better in this situation because you don't pay a lot out of your 401k. There was the case of a family that had $90,000. One of the, uh, the partners, right? Uh, I forget if it was the wife or the husband, got sick and they needed emergency surgery. And their insurance company did not cover all of the costs. And as a result of that, they went and they went to get their money out of Wells Fargo, which was managing their 401k. And by the time they walked out of the hospital, uh, excuse me, of the bank, they had only $30,000 because of fees they never knew anything about and how the active management of this fund. By the time they walked out of the hospital, they owe the hospital another $30,000 in fees that they had no way of paying. So again, don't just sign up for a 401k, do the research. Another investment could be a fine art collection, and most of us don't have access to be able to buy expensive art that is going to increase in value. But just in defining the types of investments, those are uh, different types of investments. Unless you collect gold in large quantities, again, gold is not a good investment unless you do that. Your education can be a great investment. And by this, I don't mean go and get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD. Your investment should be this. And I mentioned this in my other training on finances. You go to work at a job that you may or may not enjoy, nine to five, and then you come back and then you go take a class on real estate and you become a real estate agent after two semesters, let's say. That education is an investment, right? I have an 18-year-old who became a real estate agent and in one year he sold about six houses $10,000 um, income out of each of one of those deals. Therefore, he made about $60,000. The next year, he sold two houses. It wasn't a good year, but because he was saving the money, he wasn't worried. That's how it works. Your education, picking up a new book that is going to give you more information. And if you go to my website, again, I sell my own books on different areas. But then soon I will have a suggestive list of readings on finances, on this, on that, mental health, all of that stuff. You're welcome to go over there and check it out. And your own business can be a great investment if you plan it correctly. If what you, the product that you're selling is a good product, whether it is that you open a restaurant at the right time in the right location, that you open a bakery shop at the right time, in the right location, that you know whatever your business is, your business could be that you went to the community college, you took several classes on how you can teach people to start their own small businesses, and you have your regular career, but then on the side, on weekends and evenings, you get contracted to assist people with that process. That is a side business. And you get to deduct a lot of expenses. So that's a great investment. And of course, investments in the stock market. And so there is a lot of fear about investing in the stock market. And today we're going to talk about 
why we shouldn't be fearful. And if we, in fact, can invest, then, you know, let's do it. But I'm going to also get you to think about whether you're ready to do the investment. So when is the right time to invest in the market? If you are, again, 16-year-old, 17-year-old making $1,000 a month because you're working at a fast food restaurant or maybe another business, you technically cannot invest in the stock market by yourself, but you can have somebody create what we call a custodial account, and I'll go more into detail in a minute. So all you have to be able to prove is that you are making money, that there are receipts or evidence that the money is being made legit. So if you're getting paid cash at a restaurant, let's say, you're going to have a hard time doing this. But if somebody's creating the custodial account and they can demonstrate that they make enough money, then you basically can give them the money and they can invest into this custodial account. And again, some individuals start investing at the age of 18, 19, and then they keep their money there. And 10 years later, they say they are ready to buy a home and they take the money or some of the money out as a down payment or closing cost on a home. Some individuals, again, will start a Roth IRA with the organization or the company that I personally invest in called M1 Finance. You have to start a Roth IRA with $500 minimum. And let me take a second and explain what the Roth IRA is and why is it different than a 401k, for example. A Roth IRA, you don't get to discount the money that you invested in there, which you could do up to $6,000 a year, in the taxes from this year. And that's why some people enjoy the 401k, because when it's time to do your taxes, there's a line that says, did you invest any money in retirement? Yes, I did. Therefore, you get um, credited all that money that you invested in your 401k, and therefore, your income is supposed to be less. Therefore, you pay less in taxes, and everybody celebrates. The downside is if you make you know, a $6,000 investment in your 401k today, but in 40 years, that 401k made another $40,000 on those original $6,000. Now you're going to pay taxes on the $46,000. And that's the downside. The Roth IRA, you don't get any credit today towards your taxes. But if you make $10 million, when it's time to get it out, then you don't pay any taxes on it. So again, at the end, I'll share my information if you want to start a Roth IRA. If you're, like, say, 18, 19, and you're making enough money, you start with 500 and then you can just set it to auto deposit $25, $50 a month, and directly without you thinking about it, and then... Once a year, you go check it, and you'll be surprised how much money you have. And again, I mentioned custodial accounts, and I'll go more into detail. But basically, custodial accounts is something you can do for minors, which means your children, your nephews, nieces, uh, little brothers, little sisters. You can create that account. And at the age of 18, in states like California, that money and that control is turned over to them in other states in the United States, is at the age of 21. And again, it's important that people understand when is the right time to invest in the stock market. Well, if you owe money on a car, let's say, and your loan is at 10% or 7%, but you're only going to make 5% in the market, then you're losing money and it's better for you to finish paying that car as soon as possible. So then you can start investing in the market. Right? I had a student recently that was making a 12% interest payment on a car. He had been making this payment for three years. What he didn't know is that the specific credit union 
that he had borrowed the money from, after six months of consecutive payments on time, he could have asked them to look at his percentage and they could have lowered it to 2.78. And then he could have saved himself a lot of money. Recently, I supported him with that process and he saved himself seven months of payments with a simple phone call. Again, finish paying what you owe unless your, your interest is so low on that car payment or whatever other debt that you have, credit cards maybe, that the money you're going to make in the market completely is double, triple, or quadruple what the interest you're paying on this other loan. And here's where I stop for a second. And again, just remind individuals on in Robinhood, in order to start an account, you're supposed to be 18 years old, have a valid social security number, and be a resident of the United States, citizen of the United States. Robinhood and the next two other organizations technically don't allow people who are not um, documented to start business or, or to conduct business with them. I should also clarify that it is perfectly legal for undocumented immigrants to invest in the stock market. There is no federal law that says that you cannot do it. These companies just choose not to do so. But again, there are some companies that do. You can reach out independently later on and ask, and I know of at least one company that allows you to do so, and we can talk about it. M1 Finance says the same thing, yet, you know, some individuals, if you have a valid social security number, you have income that you can prove uh, through, again, pay stubs, W-2s, they may ask you for your taxes. They um, don't ask many questions. But again, it's a personal decision. And then the other one is Betterman. Betterman also doesn't allow for undocumented immigrants to do business with them. These are investment uh, companies. Betterman, by the way, is one of the few that does custodial accounts. And so does recently M1 Finance. And so I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But again, check around, look around. Other than that, if you're able to do so, do so, uh, you know, consider making an investment. And again, it's important for people to understand if they are undocumented, again, here's the explanation. Again, the 401k versus the Roth 401k. Again, I already explained 401k. If you have a job in you know of a 401k because everybody knows a little bit about 401k, go back to work on Monday or whatever other day you're working and ask in the office if they also offer a Roth 401k. Many individuals just simply never ask. The companies may offer it and they just don't ask. And that's it. A Roth 401k would be much, much better, and a Roth IRA would be much, much better. And again, for undocumented community members, reach out, and we'll see uh, how much support we can give you. And talking about custodial accounts, again, Betterman allows individuals to do custodial accounts. Sometimes their policies change, so depending when you're checking their business out. Robinhood doesn't allow for custodial accounts. M1 Finance just starting uh, to support custodial accounts, but you have to be a member of the M1 Plus, and that costs about $120 a year. Now, that may be tax deductible at the end of the year, you would have to talk to your accountant to confirm. But personally, I would recommend you do custodial accounts with children as long as they have valid social security numbers and the rest. 
but don't just do it for one child. Like if you are going to invest $120 a year to have this custodial account, then make sure that you are in charge of all of the accounts of, uh, for yourself, maybe if you have your own children, your nephews, nieces, maybe your little brother, sister, whomever it is that you have, and then you can start 10 custodial accounts because they don't charge you by the number of custodial accounts. They charge you $120. And so gather several family members who are underage and just get the parents to explain it to parents. How does it work? And then get them to invest. Get them to understand that you have no control over the money, that that money will never come to you or the parents, that it will go directly to those children when they turn 18 or 21, depending on the state. And then again, for birthdays, for Christmas, for whatever other celebrations that you usually give them presents, say to everyone, instead of presents, we are accepting small donations towards the custodial account, towards the five to nine college investment account. And that way you get to educate other individuals, okay? But I don't see it as a good investment if you're just gonna invest for one child, maybe for two children. But if you're gonna invest for three or four or five, and let's say those children are three and four years of age, by the time they are out there, if you continue to put some money in there, if you were to compare how the stock market is gonna do versus a credit union or a bank, you are definitely best off investing in the stock market. And here's how it works. Let's say you are looking at making 10% annually. And in year one, you invest $10,000. And you never do a single thing so you start with $10,000, and by the end of year one, you made $1,000. Now you have $11,000. So you start with $11,000 in year two. By year three, you have $12,100. By year five, you have $14,661. By year 10, in those initial $10,000, you now have more than doubled your investment to $25,937. And at 10% annually, if you just leave it there for 40 years, you now have $452,000. But if on average annually, you made 15%, you start with $10,000, and by the end of 40 years, you can have $2.6 million. That's the thing, that you invest $10,000, and in this example, it took about seven and a half years for you to double that amount. And then you start now with $20,000, and... In seven and a half years, you're gonna have more than 40,000. Then you start with that and it just continues to double and double and double. And in fact, it is in the later years when it just goes and increases by large amounts. When you think about one of the um, investors that a lot of people uh, know, uh, Warren Buffett, he didn't make most of his money until the last 20 years. Before the last 20 years, he only had made a couple of billion dollars, maybe five. It was since then that he just kept doubling and doubling and doubling the amount, and that's why he's worth about $85 billion. That's compound interest. And that's why it's worth investing in the stock market. Now, individuals will tell you, well, what if the market crashes? The market will self-correct every eight to 10 years, but it will have great years 
Warren Buffett, it, it, I invest in, in his company, uh, Berkshire uh, Hathaway. His company, depending on the year, but sometimes he makes 30% in the investment in one year. Other years, 20%. Other years, 18%. Even if the market crashes for one year, what you've been making in all the other years makes up for the crash. And his company was one of the ones that in 2008 really didn't lose a lot of money as other companies. So that's where the research goes and to what companies do you invest in? Berkshire Hathaway, for example, invest in about 40 or more than 40 companies, but invest in a specific companies. They invest in Disney, they invest in Apple, they invest in Microsoft, they invest in, again, these companies, including Coca-Cola, where they know that there is a long history of successes. And then they take risks with smaller companies. They took uh, Seas Candy, for example, and Seas Candy was not making a lot of money. Seas Candy, a year ago, made over $200 million in profit. And that's the thing. Why do you want to be doing the erroneous thing that most kids are doing now, which is, oh, do you know that GameStop is, you know, making a lot of money? Okay, I'm going to drop these other ones I had. I'm going to sell them, and I'm going to invest in GameStop. Yeah, but you only own them for three months. Do you understand that you're going to end up paying fees, more taxes, I should say, because you didn't keep the ownership of those stock for at least a year, as is the requirement. A lot of people are just motivated to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. And in reality, again, they're not making any money. Unless you are investing $20,000 and $50,000 at a time, it's not worth it. If you are moving $200 here and $200 there, it's not making a difference. And when it's time to do your taxes, you're gonna pay a lot of money. So what type of companies do you invest in? Again, established companies. Apple, Nike, Coca-Cola, right? Companies that are going to survive a recession, a depression, and again, some of the companies I mentioned and some of the companies I'm going to mention in a minute have this, right? They lasted 20, 30, 50 years or more. Corporations that provide dividends. And again, that's money that they give you every month, but you don't take it out. You just let it automatically reinvest. Corporations that adjust to the changes that are happening due to technology, the environment, everything else, and therefore still have a future, right? Apple, everybody has either an Android or an Apple, and a few companies have all, you know, all their products, but that's exactly what we're talking about. Corporations where, again, investors are the majority owners. If you have a family-owned company, but some of the stocks are sold to the public, but it's less than 50% owned by the public or investors, that is, and the family owns 50 to 51%, then you are not sure that you want to invest in there because you will always be outvoted. So you always want a company where the shareholders the ones who own the stock are the ones who have the final vote. And this time of the year is when you start getting all these emails of, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is going to have their event on April this. 
show up live, and then you get to vote or determine who you want to vote for you in regards to several items that will be discussed in the coming. That's the type of stuff. Corporations that, again, are priced correctly, you have to do some research to determine is the price that the stock is being sold for, is it overpriced? You have to go back and look at several years and see, oh, no, no, somebody is suggesting that they're going to do well in the future, but today is too expensive. Well, let's not invest in that company. And again, corporations that understand, uh, fully understand uh, the future of the investment, right? Where do we invest our money? How do we invest it? Do we create something new? Coca-Cola is probably one of the best investments. And the reason why is because there's no research that needs to be done in the Coca-Cola product. It's a red can. You go anywhere on the planet and you say Coca-Cola and everybody's minds go to that red, red can that people had consumed at some point. They don't have to do research on it. So you're, they're not investing more money in it. And they give you dividends every month. That's exactly what you're looking for. So here are some examples of those companies. Disneyland, or Disney Corporation, I should say. Again, they have investments in film. They have investments in television. They have investments in music, in radio, in gaming, in finance, in theater. So if you buy stocks with Disney, you are buying into all of these things. If one piece of it falls apart, it's okay. The other pieces are still making enough money, so you're not wasting your investment. Coca-Cola. When people think Coca-Cola, often they mistakenly think it's one product. No. The Coca-Cola Corporation owns all of the products like Minute Maid and Sprite and Powerade and all of these other products so that as one of my uh, students or former students who is an investor says, when I see somebody at a restaurant drinking Coca-Cola or at a store buying a package of Coca-Cola, I want to approach them and I want to say thank you. Thank you to you for consuming this product because you are making me money. He says, when I go to the gym and I see that somebody's wearing Nike shoes and Nike shorts and a Nike shirt, I want to go there and say, thank you. I am really grateful to you because you are making me a lot of money. Please continue to buy that product, right? Again, these are the issues that you have to research it and understand that the next time you see somebody drinking Powerade, it's a Coca-Cola product. And if you have money invested there, then you're making money. Anytime you see somebody drinking or purchasing Minute Maid juice, for example, again, and you have money invested there, you can, um, again, be grateful because they're making you money. That sandy water, uh, smart water, all of these products, again, are owned by the same corporation. And if you have money invested there, you are making money. And that's how it works. This is established corporation. A recession may happen. People are still going to drink Coca-Cola. And so with M1 Finance is where I personally invest uh, my money or is one of the ways. I'm going to tell you about other places where you can also invest your money. But M1 Finance is one of the places where you can put your money and feel, uh, again, that they know what they're doing uh, with the investment because you choose where your money is going to go, how is it going to be invested, and what I have for you is my referral code. For now, depending when you're receiving this information, for now, if you invest $100 in a regular investment where you wanna buy stock 
uh, Coca-Cola, maybe uh, you wanna uh, you know, buy into AT&T. Uh, if you wanna do that, then uh, we're using that code by investing a hundred dollars for a short period of time, depending when you're getting this information, you will get uh, uh, automatically after you finish the process, $30 added to your investment. And yes, to be transparent, I will too get $30 on that investment. And so that is exactly what this is all about, right? So it's important that you keep in mind that these companies are the ones that are being uh, successful now in handling your investments. And so one of the things that I'm gonna do for a second is I am going to tell you, just list out uh, the, the different companies that I created my account with and I have my money invested in. So I did a certain percentage of my investment is on an S&P 500 ETF with Vanguard. I also have an S&P 500 um, investment that is called a high dividend low with Invesco. And I have another high dividend yield ETF with Vanguard. And those are some of my investments in the index funds and bonds. Again, you don't have to do much. You just say, I want this one, and the computer takes care of the rest, basically. That's how it works. I also have money invested in Berkshire Hathaway. I have money invested in Costco. I have money invested in 3M Corporation. I have money invested in Philips Corporation. Medtronic, and then I also have money invested in consumer products like Procter & Gamble, which makes toothpaste, toilet paper, a bunch of other products, Johnson & Johnson, which now also is selling the vaccine to the government and then eventually to other governments, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and Pfizer. So I bought this before the pandemic, interestingly enough, but again, these two companies are now selling their product to the government. And then the last two that I own is money in uh, Verizon and AT&T. So again, I apologize, I didn't put it as a slide, I didn't list all of them, but it was a last minute decision to actually share which companies. If you want the list, I can create a list. You can send me an email. Uh, you can send me an Instagram uh, message and I will be more than happy to share that with you. Also, I can send you the code if you don't wanna type the whole code to start uh, M1 Finance account. Be aware, if you don't use the code, then the $30 are not happening because you're just starting an account without the referral. Other places where you can invest is Lending Club. Lending Club is where you become the banker and people borrow from you. For Lending Club, you have to be 18. They used to do custodial accounts and then recently they decided in October, November that they were no longer gonna uh, do that. That's why I'm moving custodial accounts to M1 Finance. But basically, you start with $1,000 here. And what they do so that you don't end up losing all your money in case somebody doesn't pay back is what you do is you invest the money, you decide how big of a risk you wanna take in that investment, and then they lend the money in $25 amounts. So if somebody's borrowing, let's say, up to $40,000 for a business or a home investment, whatever, what this company does is they'll lend 
$25 from your account and $25 from multiple accounts, if the person ends up not paying you your money back, you lost $25. But in the other investments, on average, you get 6 to 7% return every year. And that's why it's worth it. And again, this is something that you should consider. It's called Lending Club. And it's a company based out of San Francisco. And it's one that you can consider. But minimum investment is $1,000. And then last here is Fundrise, another one that I invested in about three years ago. I actually just got an email last week that said, we want to celebrate with you your third anniversary investing with us. This one is where you start with $500. And what happens is they do something similar as Lending Club. In this situation, somebody comes for a loan to buy a building, renovate the building, or um, build a building and you are an investor. And the interesting part about this is if the person uh, finishes the building, let's say, and then says, now I'm short of money, I cannot pay you back, we now own that building, her country. If at the end of the day, the building is sold to another company, this company gets paid back first. And then all other investors will get their money. But the fundraise investors, that's part of the contract, they get first dibs in any money that is made up. The goal here obviously is that you don't lose your investment. But obviously those $500 are not invested in one uh, investment. They diversify it in the portfolio. That way you again don't lose your money. This one again, $500 is the minimum investment that you can make. Uh, you do have to be 18 years old. Lending Club no longer does custodial accounts and Fundrise has never done custodial accounts, um, but that's uh, something for you to keep in mind. I realize that I have presented to you a lot of information today. What I tell individuals is if I could do this workshop in person, this would be a three to four hour presentation. You, we would do activities. We would talk about your future planning. We would take breaks, all of this stuff. So it's really three to four hour training. And why do I even mention this? It's because maybe the first time around you go through it and you finish it. Then you take a break you go do something else, and then you come back and you start working on the first questions that I had at the beginning. And then you take a break and go work on it for a week or two. Then you come back and work on the next part of the training and so on and so forth. But if you're ready to invest, again, my referral code is there, or you can reach out to me and we can give you that information. Finally, I want to go over this information. You should always have car insurance, life insurance, and home insurance, if you already are purchasing a home, that is going to prevent people from coming after your other investments. I often talk with individuals, and you can go to my training on how to purchase a vehicle, but I always talk to individuals and say, Hey, that's a beautiful car. You have a $30,000 car, bad investment to begin with. Um, and again, go check out that other video to get more information as to why. But how much coverage do you have in that? Because if I remember correctly, you just bought, you just started the process. You are now buying a home. You're living there. The home is worth a half a million dollars. But how much is your car insurance? How much does it cover? And then 100% of the people I've spoken with, whether they were teenagers, adults, or people in their 40s and 50s, they always tell me the same thing. I got full coverage. And I said, that's wonderful. Now, 
how much coverage do you have? I have full coverage. Okay, yes, but what does it cover? It's full coverage. What do you mean? And then I invite them to go and get the paperwork from their insurance, and they bring it to me, and it says, we are covering $40,000 for accident. Well, your car is worth $30,000. If you're distracted and you get into an accident and you crash into a Tesla, a $150,000 Mercedes, or some other expensive vehicle and you destroy it, the insurance company is saying that in damage, they are going to pay $40,000. But if the car is worth $150,000, you are responsible for the rest of the money. What is going to happen? Yes, they're going to turn around and they're going to sue you. And they're going to put a lien on your home. They're going to force you to sell the house. And the profit, if any, is going to go to them. Now you are homeless. That's not where you want to go. Or they find out that you have investments in the stock market. They will force you to sell your investments to pay back all that money. Start thinking as an investor. Right? That's the difference between the investor that thinks about all of the things that could go wrong and not just the individual who's living paycheck to paycheck who has never considered the possibility of investing in the market. As far as life insurance, if your house, again, is worth half a million dollars and you still owe 350000 well, get life insurance that, uh, that is going to cover $600,000, right? That way, if you die, your family will get enough money to finish paying the home and will not end up homeless. And then they should still have start up money to continue to survive while they grieve your loss. And you should get life insurance. The different types of life insurance, I will do another training in the very near future about the different types of life insurance. Please do not be mistaken. I just gave an example of one type of life insurance. And again, home insurance, it should cover, you know, everything, including rebuilding. In 2017, in Sonoma County, California, there was a huge fire, and many individuals lost their homes to the fire. And it wasn't until the insurance company showed up to support them with rebuilding that many people ended up selling their properties and never rebuilding because their home insurance covered $450,000. But rebuilding that home to what it looked like originally because of inflation, the cost of living increases, it was going to cost $600,000. And they didn't have the $150,000 just sitting around. And so many individuals sold their properties and moved out of the area and moved to other locations where maybe the homes were cheaper with the money that the insurance company gave them. Those are the things to always keep in mind. With that, I want to remind you, my name is Rafael Vasquez Guzman. My organization is called Líderes del Futuro. My website is líderesdelfuturo.org, where you can purchase my book, Fulfilling the Dream, a guide for immigrant parents and allies living in the United States. There's a Spanish version, and there's other pieces that you can find there, including my Instagram information, including my podcast and other information. I have a radio show that is bilingual on Thursdays from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at kbbf.org. And again, I have my Instagram at Lidres underscore Dale underscore Futuro. And I apologize, I misspelled that. That should say uh, Futuro with double O at the end. So I apologize for that. And again, if you want the code, the reference code, it is Lideres del Futuro at yahoo.com. You don't have to make a long email. Just say, please send me the M1 Finance referral code. I'll be more than happy to respond to you. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. And again, keep reviewing this information. And if you feel that this was useful to you and could be useful to other individuals, 
please, I invite you to share this information with other individuals. We don't have to be living paycheck to paycheck anymore. There is a way to retire, retire early and actually enjoy our lives. Thank you.